What's going on ladies and gentlemen, Dr. D-Dub here, and as you can probably tell from the title of today's video, we're doing something a little different today. This is gonna be the first video in a three-part series, I'm thinking it's gonna be three parts at least, of the process I went through to get to where I am today. I decided I wanted to build a computer. Some of you guys have probably seen that in some of my other videos. I've been talking about wanting a new rig to edit videos on and all of that. And here I am with all the parts to do just that. So this first part, I wanna kinda of go over the process of how I went from wanting to build a computer to actually having the parts to do it. And I'm gonna kinda of break down my thought process on how I decided on each component. This is by no means a tutorial. There are plenty of other great tutorials out there on YouTube, and a lot of those I watched to learn all of this and educate myself to the point to where I felt comfortable enough to purchase the components and build a PC by myself. I wanna start off by thanking a couple guys on YouTube that were absolutely instrumental in helping me gain the knowledge to be able to build a PC. I'll link all their channels down below in the description. We've got Kyle from Bitwit, who does fantastic tutorials on building and just walkthroughs, reviews, all of that. Also, Paul from Paul's Hardware, Jay from Jay's Two Cents. Both those guys do very in-depth reviews as well and Linus over at Linus Tech Tips and his whole team, they are incredible as well. I highly recommend checking out their videos because again, this is not a comprehensive review or tutorial or any of that. They have much more detail and can explain things much better than I can, but those are some of the guys I used and some of the tools I utilized to gain the knowledge that I hope I have. <laughs> Also, Tech Deals has some great videos on the best deals you can get for what you're purchasing. It might not always be the cheapest, but he has great videos on getting the most bang for your buck. So he was also a huge help. So again, links to their channels will be down in the description below. So first off, when I was building my computer, a lot of people recommend you need to know what you're building your PC for before you build it. I'm not gonna spend thousands upon thousands of dollars if all I'm going to be doing is editing Word documents and watching YouTube videos. I've recently gotten into YouTube, obviously, and I found myself doing a lot of video editing, which isn't something I planned on doing when I purchased my laptop that I currently have, which is an HP Spectre X360, which is not cutting it at all. It's a great laptop, but not for what I'm doing. So I decided I needed a laptop that could handle mild gaming, which is what I do. I don't do anything crazy and some pretty decent video editing. I don't do any 4K or anything, so I don't need a crazy graphics card or anything like that, but I do need something capable of handling basic video editing. What I have now doesn't quite work. I have to lower the settings in my timeline down to the lowest, and it just chugs along. It's not ideal. So I wanna walk you guys through how I came to the decision to purchase each component that you see here. There's a lot of different PC components on the market, and I kinda wanna break down my novice, no really experience thought process on how to go about purchasing these components. So once you've decided that you want to build a PC, how do you go about choosing parts? The website I used was pcpartpicker.com. It has a list of all the necessary components that you need, all of which are necessary, except possibly a graphics card and my additional, one of my two hard drives. Uh, but we'll cover that in a sec. It has a category for every necessary component for your computer, allows you to go in and search by category, um, very in-depth filters, which helps a lot in finding what you're actually looking for. It also uh, will compare prices from dozens of different online retailers, so you know you're getting the best online price. Um, you can sometimes go to a physical brick and mortar store and find better prices, but it kind of gives you an idea of roughly what price you'll be looking at when all is said and done. It also has a compatibility filter that will filter out all things that won't work with your already selected components, which is great. And it's just a super helpful website. It also has a, a wattage counter, which will help when it comes to picking a power supply as well, but that's something we'll get into at the end. But again, PC part picker, Use it if you're wanting to build a PC, it is fantastic. So first off, we'll start with the CPU. The CPU is sort of the brains of your computer. And one thing that I was looking for was something known as hyper-threading. So this CPU that I have right here, it's the Ryzen 5 1600, 
has six cores and 12 threads. Any CPU that has double the amount of threads as cores is what's known as a hyper-threaded CPU. If it had six cores and six threads, it would not have hyper-threading. The best explanation I've ever heard for what hyper-threading is and how it works was done by Linus over at Linus Tech Tips. He basically compared it to eating. You've got one hand bringing food to your mouth and your mouth is eating. So your cores are your mouth. If one hand is feeding your mouth and you can chew faster than your hand can bring food to your mouth, your mouth isn't working at its optimum efficiency. It's sitting there waiting for the hand to bring it food. That's how cores and threads work. So if you have hyper-threading, you now have two hands or threads that can feed the cores or your mouth, making sure that your cores or your mouth are operating at maximum efficiency. So I made sure I wanted something with hyper-threading because video editing is a heavily threaded process, which means it takes advantage of threading. The more threads you have, more or less, the better, up to a certain point. So when picking the CPU, you have really two main families to pick from. You've got AMD and Intel. Uh, and families probably isn't the right word. They're two different companies, two different manufacturers. Within each of those lines, you sort of have families, subfamilies, and then the individual product. So I decided to go with AMD. And my reasoning for that is price to performance. For the amount of money I spent on this, I am getting more bang for my buck than if I went with a comparable CPU from Intel. Within AMD, they have a family called Ryzen. Within Ryzen, they have three, or four subfamilies, Ryzen 3, Ryzen 5, Ryzen 7, and Ryzen Threadripper. I decided to go with Ryzen 5, and then within Ryzen 5, they have four individual chips. The Ryzen 5 1400, 1500X, 1600, and 1600X. And so I have the third highest of those four, which is the Ryzen 5 1600. It has six cores, 12 threads, and cost about $180 after all was said and done. The most comparable chip I could find on Intel's side of things was about 250. So price to performance, that is why I chose AMD over Intel, and specifically the Ryzen 5 1600. I'm hoping this will serve me well. I've read great reviews, and that is sort of how I picked that CPU. So once you've decided what CPU you're going to use, you need something to house that CPU in, which is a motherboard. In this case, I've gone with the ASUS ROG Strix B350F gaming motherboard. When it comes to choosing a motherboard, first you have to make sure it's compatible with your CPU. Each CPU, it's designed to fit in a particular socket. In this case, this CPU fits in an AM4 socket, so you need to make sure you have a motherboard that has an AM4 socket which narrows down your options by a ton from the get-go. Once you've decided on the socket, which again is decided by the CPU, and that's why you wanna pick your CPU first before a motherboard, or really before anything else. But once you've decided on your socket type, you then need to decide on your chipset. In the case of this AM4 socket, I have three chipsets available to me. There's the A320, the B350, which is what I have right here, and there's the X370. The difference between those, the A320 does not support overclocking, which is basically feeding more power to your components to get more power out of them than they're rated for. Um, that's overclocking in a very simplified nutshell. But the A320 does not support overclocking. The B350, however, does and the X370, which is their enthusiast line of motherboards. I don't consider myself an enthusiast. This is my first computer. <laughs> but the X370 just supports, uh, it has better support for what's known as SLI, um, which is basically using two uh, NVIDIA graphics cards, two or more simultaneously, which I don't plan on doing if I do anything, it's gonna be just upgrading my current graphics card, not adding a second one. So th again, that's not something I was really looking for. So I decided upon my socket, which in this case is AM4. I decided on my chipset, which in this case is B350. And from there, you only have 
several options. You have hundreds to begin with, and I've narrowed it down at this point to about a dozen or so. From that point, you're looking at the features that come with the motherboard. How many USB 3 or 2.0 headers does it have? Can it support RGB lighting? Um, how many DIMM slots does it have? Um, which is where your RAM gets slotted into. Um, another important thing is the size of your motherboard. So they make, you know, AM4 sockets with B350 chipsets in a lot of different, well, not a lot of different sizes. There's four different sizes of motherboards. You've got the smallest, which is mini ITX. It's a basically a tiny little square. You've got micro ATX, which is a smaller version of what I have here, which is an ATX board. And they even make bigger boards, which are called extended ATX or E-ATX. Not as common. ATX is definitely the most common. And then you get smaller and smaller if you're going for a really small form factor build, which I'm not. I just want a standard, I say standard with a grain of salt, but a standard computer. So I went with the most common standard ATX sized board with all the features that I wanted. And I think it looks beautiful. We'll unbox this in part two and see everything and actually build the computer in part two. So you'll get a closer look of this then. But I think for my needs, this more than suits what I need. So we've got our CPU, we've got our motherboard. The next thing that I at least looked at was RAM. So there are a lot of options when it comes to RAM. In today's day and age, you're most likely going to be using what is known as DDR4, which is the most current generation of RAM. Within that generation, there are a whole bunch of different speeds, uh, which are rated in megahertz, and then timings, which is four series of numbers that indicate stuff that uh, it's a lot. There are videos out there that explain it better than I could ever even hope to. I don't even understand it all myself, but I know which numbers are important and that's enough for me. But I decided to go with Team Force Dark DDR4. It's a two by eight kit and it's rated at 3000 megahertz. It's got 16, 18, 18, 38 timings as well, which again, I don't really know all of what that means, all I know is the speed is basically how fast it can perform a, a process or when it's requested for data, how quickly can it execute that request. And the first number in, the, in those timings, which in this case is 16, is how many milliseconds, I think it's in milliseconds, it takes for it to begin that process. So those two numbers in conjunction make up how fast or how well your memory will run getting two sticks instead of a, so I have a two by eight gig kit. I went for that instead of a one by 16 kit. It's still 16 gigs of RAM, but having two sticks rather than one stick is always recommended. It runs much better. Again, couldn't tell you why, but running two sticks rather than one is always preferred. So if you have the budget and it's available and will work with your motherboard, make sure to get two rather than one or if you want more, you can do that too. And on the subject of compatibility with your motherboard, you wanna make sure that your RAM that you purchase is also listed as being compatible with your motherboard. So if you go on the manufacturer's website of your motherboard, they'll usually have a section under motherboards that will show you their QVL or qualified vendor list. This is going to be a list of all the RAM that has been tested with that specific motherboard and they will guarantee that it will run at its rated speed. So again, I have a kit of 3000 megahertz RAM that I have checked and it is on the QVL for this motherboard. So that means it is guaranteed to run at 3000 megahertz, which is what it's advertised as. You could get away with using this kit on a non-verified motherboard, potentially, but it doesn't guarantee that one, it will even work, period, or two, that it will run at its rated speeds. I might only be able to run this 3000 megahertz kit at a lower speed because it's not compatible with that motherboard. So that is something, if you care about speeds and making sure you're getting what you pay for, that is a good thing to check, the QVL on your motherboard list. But that is pretty much how I came to the RAM. And also, I think it looks pretty cool and that was somewhat of a deciding factor for all of this stuff, it's going to be sitting on my desk, my computer, 
and I want it to, I'm gonna be looking at it every day, so I want it to look good. So aesthetics, for me at least, was part of the decision for pretty much everything here. Up next, we have what is arguably the most fun component in a computer, and that is the graphics card. Now, depending on the CPU you chose, you might not even need a discrete graphics card, which is just a standalone graphics card. If your CPU has integrated graphics, it's usually known as an APU or an accelerated processing unit, which means it can do both the computing processing and the graphics processing all in one given it's not usually as good when you separate the computing and the graphics processes apart, they usually function better. So this is usually the better option, especially when you get into higher end, this is pretty much your only option. You can only get away with using an APU if you're sort of staying in the lower tier of computers. When you go up from there, a discrete graphics card is pretty much required. And again, when it comes to choosing your graphics card, it's important to think back to what do you plan on doing with your computer? Again, I do very light gaming and video editing. And so I didn't need the best of the best graphics card. This will not run games at 4K or do anything incredibly fancy. However, it's a very good card for the money. This is the Asus ROG Strix NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 Ti. These names for these products are ridiculously long. I know. <laughs> but what's important to note about this graphics card is the chipset. And so that is just the GTX 1050 Ti. There are many different versions of that same chipset. So I got the Asus ROG Strix version of that card. You can also get a 1050 Ti from Gigabyte or EVGA or Zotac. There are a lot of different companies that make the same card. They just have different numbers of fans, different aesthetics, different, you know, some have a back plate, some don't. Um, and I'll cover all that when we actually unbox this thing next episode. But what's important to note is the chipset or what actual onboard chip that's doing the graphics processing is onboard your graphics card. The rest of it all just comes down to cooling and aesthetics. And in this case, I chose one that I think looks pretty good, but I had to wait for a while for it to go on sale because it is a little bit more expensive than equivalent cards that do the same thing, but that just don't look as good. And that was something, again, that was important to me, the aesthetics of the card went into my purchasing decision. But this will serve me well in what I intend to do if I ever decide to upgrade my computer. This is probably the first thing I'll be upgrading because it is on the lower end of things, but it's also one of the more expensive components in a computer. The highest end of this chip um, in this model is about $800. So that's about how much that's more than this entire computer altogether. So I made sure to spend a little bit less on the graphics card. This is the component in your computer though that is responsible for the vast majority of video processing tasks. So if that's something you're doing a lot of, it might be worth your while to invest in a higher quality chipset than what I did. But again, this will serve my needs just fine. Next, we need something to store stuff on, or more aptly named, storage. I actually have two hard drives that are going to be going in this computer, one of which is a solid state drive. It's the Samsung 850 EVO 250 gig, and I also have a two terabyte Seagate Barracuda, which is a standard hard drive. It's got spinning platters, all that, usually runs a little bit slower, but the hard drive is going to be used for our operating system and some programs that I use often. And since I do video editing, all the raw files and finished product projects and all of that will be going on the two terabyte hard drive. You only need one of these. If you have the budget for it, definitely go for an SSD. If you can, they work so much faster than hard drives. But again, they are quite a bit more expensive. This 250 gig solid state drive is an eighth of the storage space as this two terabyte and costs $30 more. So if you're just going for raw storage space, hard drives are 
a better option, but for your operating system, it's definitely ideal to have a solid state drive, which will make your computer a lot snappier. It'll move quicker, it'll respond quicker, and any applications or programs you put on that solid state drive will respond in a similar manner. So again, if you have the money for it, try to go for a solid state, or if you need even more storage on top of that, also consider adding in a hard drive. And last but not least, we come to the power supply. This is what's going to be providing power to everything you see here. If you used PC Part Picker to plan out your build, it actually has a running wattage counter, which will tell you how much power all these other components are going to be drawing. So it can give you an idea of how much juice you need your power supply to be able to provide. For my system, I think all of this came out to about 230-ish watts. I have right here the Corsair CX550M power supply, which can supply 550 watts. And that's in continuous wattage, not peak or any of those values. When you're looking at a power supply, you want to look at continuous power supply. With power supplies, you don't wanna just get one that, I didn't wanna get a 250 watt power supply to power my 230-ish watt system. The reason for that is that power supplies have what's known as an efficiency curve. And on this curve, you can see where it is most efficient at. For most power supplies, around 50% is where they're most efficient. Any less, and it drops off significantly. Any more than that, and you start losing some efficiency as well near the top end of the spectrum. So I tried to double the wattage I needed, which would put me just under 500, and I've got a 550 watt power supply, which I'm around 50% usage. And again, all these components on PC Part Picker are rated when they're idling, just to keep them running. When I start doing tasks, running games, editing videos, they're going to start drawing more power as they need more energy to spin the fans faster, to keep things cool, and just to provide more power. And so I made sure to get a power supply that could handle that as well. Another thing to consider with power supplies is their rating. So power supplies are rated in their efficiency. Some of them have no efficiency rating whatsoever. Others have, it's what's known as an 80 plus rating. So there's the 80 plus system is just 80 plus, 80 plus bronze, 80 plus silver, 80 plus gold, and 80 plus platinum. And I believe at CES, which is currently going on as I'm recording this video, they're even adding a 80 plus titanium standard, which is a step above platinum, which is crazy. But basically those ratings are saying that this power supply will operate somewhere above 80% efficiency at a given rating. There's videos out there that break it down by the, you know, at 20% load, at 50% load, and at 100% load. How efficient is it? And it has to meet certain criteria to be given a certain rating. But I went for an 80 plus bronze, which is still pretty good and it doesn't break the bank. I think this cost around $35. And that was after rebates and all that. So if you're shopping on PC Part Picker or on Newegg or wherever you decide to find your components, make sure you're doing those mail-in rebates because I think I got $20 off of this after the mail-in rebate, which is nice, especially if you're on the tight budget. Another thing about power supplies is their modularity. Some power supplies aren't modular at all. Some are semi-modular, which is what I have here, and some are fully modular. What that means is you can actually remove the cables. So you can actually see on the box here that one cable is permanently plugged in, and that is power for both the motherboard and the CPU, which no matter what other cables you use, those will always 100% of the time be needed. And that's why a semi-modular power supply was something I was looking into. The rest of the cables on a non-modular power supply, if you don't use them, you end up just having to stash them somewhere in your computer. On a semi-modular or fully modular power supply, you don't even have to use them if you're not using them in your case. You can unplug them and just not put them in your case, freeing up room for who knows what, anything else you want. I was looking for fully modular, but semi-modular was a nice happy medium. It's usually a little bit cheaper to get semi-modular rather than fully modular. And also what's lovely about this power supply is that it has black cables. Some have ugly, everyone refers to them as ketchup and mustard cables because they're just hideous. They're reds and yellows. And you can see most of what I have here is black. 
and that would totally throw off the color scheme of the computer. Again, it's purely cosmetic, but it's something to look for if aesthetics are something that matter to you in a computer. And that does it for all the components going inside the computer, but you might notice that we don't have anything here to put these components in. And that is where this comes in. The Fractal Design Define C Tempered Glass Edition. This case is, in my opinion, beautiful. It has everything I was looking for. It's got a tempered glass side panel, which means you can see into it, so you can see all of these lovely components that you made sure to pick out for their aesthetics. If you had no side panel that you could see through, there's no point in aesthetics, at least in my opinion. Your case really comes down to personal preference, unless you're going for a very high-end computer. If you have a higher-end system with components that are running at higher speeds or taking more power to run, your case is gonna get a lot hotter. So in that case, no pun intended, you need a case that has been designed for airflow, since air is what's cooling all of your components. If you don't cool them properly, they'll do what's known as thermal throttling. And in that case, your components have safety mechanisms in them that will cause them to stop working as hard to prevent them from overheating. They won't just keep working as hard as you tell them to and then just die. They will back off, they won't work as hard. And so you're basically going to lose performance if you don't cool them properly. So I'm not doing anything crazy with this case or with the components in the case. This is my first build. There's nothing, I don't plan on doing much, if any, overclocking, but I'd like to have the option in the future, which is why I went with overclockable components and a motherboard that can be overclocked instead of the lesser version. But I think between this case and these components, we've got quite the build ahead of us. If you guys have any questions at all, please let me know down in the comments below. I can't guarantee I'll have an answer for everything, but I can at least provide a link to a video or something to help you guys out. I'm aiming to provide an instructional, somewhat helpful opinion from not a professional YouTuber or tech tuber as they're known. All the videos I've watched to gain knowledge of all of these components and to help me in my purchasing decisions are done by people who do this for a living and have real fancy computers themselves and real nice setups to do all this. I'm recording this on my living room table in my dining room with no fancy tools or anything at my disposal. So I wanted to sort of make a more relatable video to those of you out there who are attempting to build your first system as well or who are just interested in computers in general. So I will see you guys in the next episode, part two of this series, where we actually get our hands dirty and build this system. I hope you guys are excited. I know I am. I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, as always, take care.